And before we begin the, the advanced analytics, Pat, I want to invite uh, Regina Holiday to the front of the room. Um, Regina is an artist and patient advocate and speaker and just a real champion for patients' rights in the healthcare space and has been leading um, a number of eff efforts in, help in helping bring about a patient-centric health system uh, through her art um, and has really touched a lot of people and a lot of lives. And we've had her here with the workshop in health IT and economics for three years now. And one of the things that we really enjoy, we find the audience enjoys, is to have Regina sort of paint her interpretations of the talks during the day and then share that um, with the audience. So with that, I'm going to ask Regina to um, give, give us a few remarks on your painting. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here again. Um, this time I drove here because I live out in the country up in Western Maryland, so it took four hours to get to you. I left at five o'clock this morning, and I was super excited to see you all and to paint about, once again, the wonderful studies that you have done in the past year. And so this painting right here is called Thought Process, because what I was hearing is this wonderful evolution of what happens. So, so within this infinity swirl, because don't assume this is just two swirls on a canvas, this is the part we capture today. It keeps going and going and going, because we are constantly changing and improving what we create. So the very beginning of this swirl, we have someone crawling out with a question. That leads to study. So we have a research scientist with little percentages, and then a congressman with a bill representing high-tech legislation, and then a vendor with a symbol for money. You know, which system are you going to purchase? And then we have another research scientist looking again and inputting data into their computer system. And finally, we have a student asking a question. And it just goes on, right? And what you are doing is constantly making this world a better place. So I applaud you, and I respect you, and keep it up, because what you do changes things for all of us. So that was the conference painting for today, but that is not the only painting I did. Kenyon came up to me and said, could I join the walking gallery? And I said, yes. So he gave me his jacket, and we painted his story today. So if you look at this painting, it's called Healing This Wound. And we have Kenyon right here in the center with his family. And we have all the students represented in this room with the wonderful things he's done to inspire you. And he's standing upon a globe where money is beneath him because that's a business, right? That's a symbol for business, right? <laughs> But then, looping off of that, we have genomics and data and all of it coming together. And then on each side, he has his stepfather and his father. And his father had MS, and that was a challenging health journey. And you wonder how much his life could be improved if we truly had interoperable systems. And the other side is his stepfather, and there's a wound on his arm. You see, he went to the hospital with a wound that would not heal. That's a data point. But in the old systems, you know, data points aren't tracked, and they're definitely not put together. And nobody put together the picture that Kenyon's stepfather had cancer, and that's why his wound wouldn't heal. And he died, because we have data points that are not together. So you know what we're doing in this room? We are healing this wound. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's, it's actually, it's true. It's, it's, it's kind of uh, emotional see, seeing that on a jacket. So go ahead, go on my back. So I'll move it up. No, it's true, but, and, you know, as we looked to, especially in preventive care with um, Mac, who was a, a small business owner with sort of the wound on his arm, it's, he ended up dying from colon cancer. But colon cancer is one of those preventive diseases that if you follow the recommended procedures, if you're seeing your primary care physician, if you have access, you're doing that, then it's one of those diseases that can be um, prevented and, and almost all of the cases, the majority of the cases. And so, I mean, it is one of those things that sparks me on to help people sort of understand their, their health information and the opportunities to engage with preventive, preventive medicine and have healthy behaviors. So uh, thanks again, Regina, for, for that. So at this point, let's turn it over to our advanced analytics panel, one of the sort of hottest of hot topics in the, the health in industry right now. Hello. Let me turn it, let me turn it over to Professor Zhang. Thank you. 
Uh, good afternoon. Um, thanks for uh, attending this panel on ana uh, advanced analytics in uh, care delivery. Uh, I'm Dong Song Zhang from University of Maryland, uh, Baltimore County. Uh, this panel is about how to use data analytics to support to improve healthcare. Uh, we are fortunate to have six uh, panelists uh, in this panel to introduce their work in this area. First, uh, please allow me to introduce our panelists. Uh, the first panelist is Yi Ye Zhang from Carnegie Mellon. Here. Here. <laughs> uh, Ralph Gross from uh, also affiliated with Carnegie Mellon. And uh, Joyce Byrne from MITRE. Yakovos uh, Kassipis from U uh, University of Maryland. Uh, Gunash Karu from University of Maryland, uh, Baltimore County, sitting far from me. And uh, Xiao Liu, I believe, sitting in the audience, also from Carnegie Mellon. Okay, so uh, here's the plan. Uh, we will have each uh, panelist to uh, take about five minutes to uh, uh, introduce their work, and then at the end, we will open the floor uh, to the audience for questions. Okay, so without further ado, let's welcome the first uh, panelist, Yi Ye Zhang from Carnegie Mellon. Thank you. Um, I, I just couldn't wait, so I, um, I stood up. Just. <laughs> okay. um, so this work is um, jointly done with Dr. Rama Panman, also from Carnegie Mellon, and uh, the goal of this paper is to learn and visualize the data-driven clinical pathways from the electronic health records data. And so I first wanted to talk about what we think, um, what we mean by clinical pathways. So clinical pathways is a map of clinical visits that patients go through during their treatments. And we're specifically looking at patients with chronic conditions, and these patients are treated in an outpatient setting, and they repeat visits to the hospital, to the clinician's office, um, over time for, for a long period of time. So, um, so the interesting questions in looking at these patients is to learn uh, the common pathways that these patients take um, in their treatments, and also how are these pathways different from one patient group to the other, and then how can we use such information to um, improve the care of um, healthcare. So, um, Actually, one challenging question and surprisingly challenging question was how to represent this data. So, so if you work with um, patients with chronic conditions, you probably know that um, all, so, so all of these patients they suffer from multiple conditions. So every time they come to see the, see the doctor, they get multiple diagnosis, they receive multiple medications, they go through uh, multiple procedures and receive multiple medical orders. And if I, if I were to apply um, traditional process mining or workflow mining um, methods on these, I'll, I'll be getting uh, things like um, the prescription of di diuretics led to the prescription of antihypertensive medication and that prescription led to the uh, diagnosis of hypertension and then the diagnosis of di uh, diabetes or so on. And, and that's not the kind of relationship that's happening. So rather, um, we, we developed some novel constructs to represent a, a pathway of um, temporal uh, re relationships that shows that the patient comes in to see the doctor with hypertension, with di diabetes, and, and receive um, diuretics, antihypertensive medications, and so on. And by representing uh, all this multidimensional and longitudinal data in, in a pathway form or sequential form, we're able to calculate the similarity of these pathways by, by using, for example, measure like longest common subsequence, and then using such similarity distance mat uh, matrix to, to apply some clustering algorithms to find the latent patient subgroups that's in the data. And within um, each uh, patient subgroups, we can visualize and model these clinical pathways as Markov chains and, and really um, find the um, interesting pathways that the, hus the, the hospital ma management may be used to improve the care, care quality. So this is um, a clinical pathway example. The circles here represent a visit uh, of a specific type. So one visit may be a hospitalization where patients are suffering from some acute conditions and, and received multiple medications. And the edges are represent, so the thickness of the edges represent the, um, the transitional probability or the transitional frequency. And um, 
if you drill down deeper into the clinical pathway, you will find um, interesting pathways such as, um, so typically um, patients with chronic kidney problems, uh, they, their kidney tend to just fail and do not improve. But here we found that for some patients, their kidney functions actually improved a bit. And for these patients, um, a lot of them actually went to education classes and learn about their condition. So it is possible that um, learning more about their conditions can help in, uh, patients improve their conditions. And so the next step, uh, which is also what I'm working on right now, is is to take these um, data-driven clinical pathways to, to, um, to predict the future care. So, so the interesting question will be uh, when a patient comes to see the clinicians, given their demographic information and their clinical histories, what are the potential outcomes of these patients given different, different, uh, different treatment plans? And our plan is to use dynamic Bayesian networks to, um, to, to model this complicated treatment process to to, to associate different treatment plans with the potential outcomes so that the physicians and um, their patients can make more engaged um, uh, decision making about the potential um, treatment options. And for now, uh, we're getting, uh, we have some uh, fair prediction accuracies. We are able to show that, um, uh, to, to, to demonstrate prediction accuracy of 0.63 up to 0.92, so it's, it's a promising work and I hope to, um, to work uh, more deeply into this problem um, in, in the coming months. So that's about my time. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Ralph Gross. I'm the chief scientist of a company called Disruptive Robotics. And uh, at Disruptive, we're concerned with building intelligent systems that help practitioners in hospitals uh, in dealing with the logistics of healthcare delivery. <clears throat> Our particular focus is on the boundary between the emergency department and the interior of the hospital. Now, um, <clears throat> as you probably all know, you know, potentially through your own experience, emergency departments in the US and in other countries around the world are often full, leading to um, <clears throat> patient wait times. Now, there are a number of reasons for that, um, part of which is the function of the emergency department within the hospital as a gateway into the hospital. Now, the front doors of the ED are always open, but the back door um, is often closed because there are no inpatient beds available for patients in the ED. And when that happens, then patient waits in, patients wait in the ED, um, which leads to bad medical outcomes. Um, the hospitals lose money, and patients don't like it um, because they have to wait. So now, <clears throat> to illustrate our approach, I show here the. Um, does this work? Yeah. Um, this is sort of a, a typical trajectory that a patient might go through in an ED. So the patient shows up, they were registered, then they wait, they are triaged, then they wait, eventually they get to a room, then they wait, and <clears throat> treatment starts, you know, they are diagnosed, and at some point the, the uh, decision might be made that um, they have to be admitted about here, which is typically the first time that the rest of the hospital learns about that particular patient. Now, oftentimes there is no inpatient bed available for that patient, and um, the interior units have then create that bed space, which takes time. Now, in our approach, um, we build a system that predicts hospital admissions based on triage data. So much earlier than um, <clears throat> the, the point later here when the admit decision is made. Um, and so the bed preparation process uh, can happen in parallel um, to the ED treatment process. We have um, a mobile device system that uh, Idris is going to talk about tomorrow morning that we use in order to communicate that information to the interior units um, so that they can start bed preparation process earlier. Um, in order to do that, we um, build a machine learning system. We use a support vector machine to classify um, the uh, patient visit data into either a discharge or an admission. Um, and we use um, this set of features described here, patient age and gender, time of arrival, mode of arrival, as well as their acuity and chief complaint in order 
um, to feed that um, system. And we trained that system on uh, about four years' worth of data from a community-sized hospital in Western PA. And um, <clears throat> the system is running right now, um, and it achieves about an 85% uh, prediction accuracy for discharge or admission, which breaks down in, um, <clears throat> in a 47% true positive rate and a 93% true negative rate. And what you see also is um, highlighted here that um, we get this uh, prediction result you know, much earlier in the uh, patient trajectory than you would typically see the um, admission decision being made. Um, <clears throat> so there's much more time for the interior units to prepare for the patient than um, they otherwise would have. Um, we've also been able to show that um, our system reduces the patient length of stay within the ED, um, the details of which, again, Idris is going to talk about tomorrow morning. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Joyce Byrne, and I work for the MITRE Corporation. Myself and my coworkers, Brendan Smith and Aman Osman, performed this preliminary research on telemedicine in humanitarian aid and disaster relief. What motivated us to do this research? We've experienced a number of disasters personally, Sandy, Katrina, Joaquim. So we started looking at UN reports. And if you look at the chart on the screen, you can see that the UN report says that over the last decade, natural disasters has increased. And the report goes on to say that it's having an increasing impact on people, infrastructure, and economies. It also predicts that this trend is going to continue. So what we did for our research is we looked at after action reports. So after every disaster, they do after action reports or lessons learned on what went wrong. And we saw recurrent themes. When a disaster occurs, there's frequently mass confusion. You don't know where people are. You don't know if they're in safe situations. You don't know what resources they need. This is what's called situational awareness. And there's a lack of it in, in disasters. In addition, local authorities are in charge, but again, they might be in unsafe situations, they might not have communications, so there's generally a lack of command as well. In the beginning, a lot of agencies show up, local, federal, and state, as well as some international aid organizations. And they frequently bring their own communication devices, and there's a lack of interoperability, so kind of a common theme here, right? And this causes a lack of communication, a lack of coordination, and a lack of collaboration across the event. There's also a high risk of disease and um, infection in disaster areas. So our question is, what can we do to eliminate this or help improve the efficiencies of the planning and the relief efforts? Our recommendation, whoops. I should have had that slide up, sorry. So our recommendation is to do a systems engineering approach. The military experiences what's called the fog of war. It's very similar to, to the beginning stages of disaster. There's mass confusion, there's lack of situational awareness, and there's lack of command and control. So we would look at the lessons learned from their implementation to try to mitigate this, and that they implemented systems engineering and what's called C4ISR. We would also look at command and control systems. And the purpose of command and control systems is to collect, correlate, analyze, and disseminate the data to get the right information to the right people at the right time or provide that much needed situational awareness. It would also help with informed decision making. We would also look at generating a reusable framework. And this framework would help inform the policy and planning for disaster relief. And it would ensure that lessons learned are fed back into the system so that it would continuously be improved. We recommend that we would use push packages and telemedicine. And why, would, why do we recommend telemedicine? So again, in disaster areas, there is frequently a lack of medical resources. And Using, the, using um, telemedicine would help eliminate that lack of resources. It would also provide some of that data that would feed into the situational awareness. 
It would also, in, for instance, in the Ebola crisis, there was a lot of first aid workers and humanitarian aid workers who were exposed to the disease. If we had sent telemedicine packages to the local workers, we could have helped eliminate some of that exposure. It would also be used to collect data and help inform decision making about where the best use of medical resources could be applied. I got a little extra time. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Jakobos Katsipis uh, from University of Maryland and uh, Institute of System Engineering. Um, today, uh, we will talk about uh, re uh, reasoning engine machine uh, that uh, helps uh, um, the decision making for uh, potential healthcare management systems. And uh, we are using uh, the model based system engineering approach. Um, here, we visualize a network where every agent here are the agents uh, that we have in the healthcare the laboratorians, the doctors, the patients. So every leakage, every, every person actually uh, communicates each other. And every uh, node produces measurable results. And uh, all these uh, measurable results uh, produce a kind of knowledge that will be stored uh, for the decision making. Um, the potential model can uh, be expandable to other diseases. In the same time, could be also scalable to, um, uh, from a community base up to a state base, like uh, we have the health information exchange systems. We have here two metrics, uh, but uh, we can have many more, actually. Uh, here, we have a health quality metrics that uh, when where V is uh, stands uh, for uh, risk uh, adjustment me uh, metric that uh, uh, is connected with every patient. So every patient uh, is giving a value for each kind of uh, uh, state that he's into his uh, uh, disease. While O stands uh, for um, uh, an accounting metric where actually we have the result of uh, a patient falling into uh, the specific uh, state of the disease. And um, the healthcare cost is very straightforward. It's the total cost that we have uh, for uh, all this uh, time period. And uh, we are taking into account all the interventions and all the diagnostic tests that uh, he followed the patients during this uh, uh, period. This is a first uh, result of trade-off analysis that we are doing between uh, two computational methods. Uh, the first method is uh, exhausted uh, Monte Carlo method, this uh, stochastic method similar to uh, Monte Carlo uh, Markov chain. And uh, the computing time, you can see that in the right side. And uh, we compare it with the uh, FONCO method, which is a multi-objective uh, multi ob uh, method that uh, is using uh, recursive uh, computing and uh, we are uh, using also dynamic programming. And as you can see, the results uh, are being solved in a fraction of, uh, of the time. Uh, the graphical representations of these computations, you can see them in the left uh, for the EMCS uh, method, for the exhausted method, and uh, um, for the FOMCO method is in the right bottom side. Um, for the simulation, we use uh, 10,000 simulated cast, uh, patients, and uh, we had 32 iterations, and uh, um, every time the mechanism had to choose based on what kind of outcome we were receiving, uh, what kind of iteration or test he will use. And uh, for this test, we had three interventions, uh, three, uh, three diagnostic tests, and 10 interventions. Other examples of uh, trade-offs that we can have here, as you can see, is uh, two tables where the V vector uh, is uh, translating now as a type of patients. And uh, we track uh, actually every improvement from a three-state uh, disease. And uh, we can see from every transition, uh, any improvement, what kind of test and what kind of intervention we were using. and. Uh, among all the, uh, all, all the cases that we had of, out of these 10,000 patients for these 10 years, we see how many times this intervention uh, shows up, 
and how many times this intervention is related with this improvement, where improvement is getting from a more disease situation to a healthier one. And in the last column, we have efficiency factor, uh, which is actually um, related with the intervention that has been used and the improvement that has been uh, happened. And uh, of course, uh, you, you can include inside much more metrics like uh, reliability of uh, disease uh, of, of the diagnostic test that you're doing, or maybe you can use uh, um, um, and other quality metrics based on uh, what he wants uh, the, the decision maker. Thank you very much. Okay, so this is a study by myself and my PhD students, Pooja and Dari, who couldn't be here today. Uh, we are from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Um, so I'll skip some of the slides. How many of you know about home care? So this is, uh, yeah, we have quite a lot of number. So this is or, uh, provided by home health agencies under a physician's uh, order. Uh, so it covers uh, skilled nursing care, physical therapy, occupational therapy, uh, or sometimes even assistance from a home aid. Uh, so we are trying to basically understand how we can improve the processes in home health agencies to reduce the hospital uh, admission rates and avoidable ER visit rates for home, home care patients. However, home health agencies have very limited resources, so they cannot uh, spend a lot of resources for improvement. So how can we do this in a focused and prioritized manner? So that was the basically essential uh, uh, question for this uh, research. Uh, so why is it important? We heard about uh, value-based payment this morning. So this is coming to home care as well, starting from January 1st. Uh, in nine states, uh, value-based payment program will apply, and home health agencies are now under pressure. And uh, frankly, it also creates a depressing environment for many uh, small providers now, because they cannot dedicate a lot of resources for uh, process improvement. So hope, uh, we hope that we could you know, provide some kind of uh, feedback so that they could get highest return on investments. So we use the Medicare Home Care Compare uh, data with some additional variables, uh, control variables such as uh, such as rurality, so, uh, median income, uh, so that we could basically include include them in the analysis. So our response variables are hospital admission rate, unplanned ER visit rate, and also 30-day admissions uh, and 30-day ER visits. So the last two were only introduced for the for the recent uh, year, and it comes from an incomplete data set. So these are the predictors used, uh, and we use a method called tree-based modeling. I'm not going to go into the details of this, but so this is the first model. Uh, so interestingly, our control variables appeared at the top of the model. So in a tree-based model, the variable uh, that reduces the variance most will appear at the top. So we see the rurality variable. Uh, so the rural agencies here appear at the, at the on the right-hand side have a higher hospital uh, admission rate. The others have 15.16. So we recursively split the data sets, uh, sub data sets uh, continuously. And the next variable appeared to be agency size, so larger agencies because possibly for, uh, because of some coordination issues have higher hospital admission uh, rates and then we have uh, some process variables uh, the first one which appeared was uh, checking for fall risks so whether the home care nurse check for fall risk or not whether the care started in a timely manner that came uh, the, the, as the next uh, variable when we look at the uh, ER visit rates, again, the uh, rurality appeared at top, and then we see checking for fall risks, uh, starting care in a timely manner, treating patients for pain, and also agency size appearing in the model. For the 30-day hospital readmissions, uh, so this is basically where the response variable is a categorical variable, and we have, again, agency size and checking for fall risks appearing in this one. For the 30-day ER visit rate, we obtained a tree which was only root, so that was no uh, variance reduction by picking any of the uh, uh, variables. So that, um, as a discussion, we can say that these uh, non-clinical variables are very crucial, so we need to include them in analysis. And if you want to give any advice to home health agencies about which processes they need to focus on first, it is the checking for fall risks and also starting care timely. These are very, very important. 
And uh, for urban HHA is also treating patients for pain, reduce the ER visit rates. As visit count increases, possibly collaboration and coordination is becoming more difficult. And um, why do we have higher rates for rural agencies? We can just hypothesize maybe quality improvement is difficult for those agencies. Could, they could be small. Maybe patients are less healthy to start with. Uh, maybe there are health literacy levels, lower health literacy levels, or they have um, less access to um, primary uh, and secondary care. So whenever there's a problem, they may be just going to the hospital or the emergency room. So these are the uh, main results. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, my name is Xiao. I'm a PhD student in University of Arizona. Today I'm going to present uh, a research progress with uh, uh, faculties in our university and uh, co-workers from Michigan State University and Carnegie Mellon University. So the topic today is about visual social media analytics for patient-centered care. So the motivation of the study is we observed that chronic disease is, uh, is among the most uh, um, common and costly of all the healthcare problems in the United States. According to a study in 2000, uh, 2012, about 170 million people are diagnosed for chronic disease. And treating those patients actually cost about 84% of the all healthcare spending on, in that year. So, uh, due to this uh, large amount of cost for treating chronic disease, self care uh, is an important uh, component for uh, chronic disease management. Um, thinking about education patients with medical knowledge to improve self care, and it will ultimately enhance chronic disease management. So, in recent years, social media has emerged as an effective approach for self-care education. Video sharing websites such as YouTube have been proven as an e effective problem for sharing uh, uh, effective platform for sharing medical knowledge. And uh, self-care ability can be improved when patients actually go to YouTube and watch videos containing proper uh, patient education and knowledge about how to maintain their conditions and promote their, their health. Uh, however, searching videos matching patients' information needs on social media platform is still a challenging task for patients. Uh, there are multiple reasons to this situation. Uh, first is the search function for YouTube. This platform only matches the keyword for video titles and the tags of the video um, <coughs> created by, by the content uploader. <coughs> The second reason is patients sometimes may not have the correct and precise knowledge about what they, they should use as search keyword. The, sec the third situation is the video titles and tags that are assigned by the content creators. Sometimes they describe the, the video inaccurately and provide misleading information just to attract attention. So there is a screenshot of uh, search results that we type in the YouTube interface for uh, search for information about cure for diabetes. And the picture shows the top, top five search results. And we can see that the first search result is a strongly biased, show a strong, strongly biased opinion towards seeing doctors for diabetes. The second the video and the fourth video are uh, commercials for diabetes treatment. And the third video is a talk given by a medical expert sharing his ex experience for managing the disease. And the fifth the video is containing false information about curing diabetes in 72 hours. <clears throat> so <clears throat> based on this observation, we feel it's very critical for health video search system to provide patients with easy access to video content helpful medical knowledge and to avoid false health information in order to improve the self-care education. Um, to address this issue, we propose to develop a deep learning based knowledge extraction system to address this problem. First, we uh, look into the literature for what kind of men, uh, medical knowledge that matters for patient self-care. And we find patients often look for treatment, disease, and the symptoms when they search, uh, when they look for inf information on the internet. 
And uh, then we think about how can we approach this uh, problem as uh, identify uh, relations between uh, tr treatment disease and symptoms. So we try to model it as a relation extraction which look for semantic relations between medical terms such as drug names, uh, disease name, and symptoms. So we develop a, recursive, a recurrent neural network model to address this issue. So uh, extract a semantic relationship among, in the text is naturally a difficult problem. Uh, we compared our model with the supervised machine learning model with support vector machine. And our model actually achieved a better performance. Um, <clears throat> so we just finished the pilot study on uh, uh, collected data and conducted the relation extraction on a small data set of um, about 5,000 YouTube video results. And in the future, we are trying to go beyond just ext extraction. We are trying to combine the medical knowledge from the social media, uh, what kind of relations expressed by user-generated content with what knowledge exists in the medical knowledge basis to see the quality of the uh, video videos on YouTube related to healthcare topics. And we also tried to design a user study to evaluate how patient video search experience can be improved by filtering these false information, and how can this improve the patient education. And that's all. So my question is to Rolf. Uh, what was the door to uh, dog time uh, in your sample? So in that particular hospital, they um, don't use uh, physician in triage. Um, Sorry? They don't use physician in triage. So yeah, yeah. The so first are, are provider longer. contact was? Um, it's half. about half an hour. OK. Um, so I was wondering if you, perhaps you're doing it. Uh, you're using prediction based on triage data, but after physician contact, you, they may enter some CPD codes, and then lab tests will start coming in. Do you actually improve your prediction as the patient is going through that uh, the ER? Um, or at this point, it's just um, triage data, and you predict, and then that, that's all? So in, in um, <clears throat> current operation, we only use triage. Um, that is mostly due to um, data access issues. So we recently got access to the um, EMR components that um, give us additional information as it's collected during the patient visit. And we're in the process of including that as well. Right. Yeah, and we certainly wouldn't argue that you know you're ever going to build a system that's 100% accurate just on triage data. Um, so you know it's it's doing a good job in in you know cases that are um, you know not difficult to figure out. You know if somebody shows up with abdominal pain, you know these are oftentimes hard to figure out because there are you know a number of reasons that might cause this. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the point really is not so much in, in the accuracy, but it's, it's more in the overall system setup that allows um, our system to run in parallel to um, <clears throat> the regular, you know, processes and, you know, alert the interior nurses to likely candidates that they might see. So, <clears throat> you know, in order for the system to be helpful, it doesn't have to be 100% accurate. Uh, it has to just be accurate enough um, <clears throat> to uh, to provide the value that that we're looking for. So is your is, is your hope to go to replace anyone that you guys with? No, no, um, we we wouldn't uh, we wouldn't suggest that. Um, we have too many physician investors to uh, to do that. Um, <clears throat> no, the um, you know we're not trying to um, to you know replace you know the. Um, human component in here, but you know what we're trying to do is you know offload them from these logistics tasks that nobody wants to do, that people aren't particularly good at because you know I'm, you've probably been in emergency um, departments. It's a very chaotic environment. 
people are interrupted all the time, um, <clears throat> and it's hard to to do these sort of mundane things of keeping track of like here's the patient, here's what I have done, here's what needs to be done, here's who I have to call, here's who I have to notify, um, <clears throat> and you know for these kind of tasks, you know, a um, you know, intelligent system is much better suited. Um, it's not um, to you know assess a patient and um, and you know come up with the best treatment. So I would like to thank the, pa uh, the, the panel, you know, for presenting such a core cool technologies, right? So the next step uh, is about how to make these tools being used by the providers. So my question is to uh, everyone here, I wonder whether you could share some insights on how to create the buy-in from the provider side. That is, they are interested in using the tools and this really creates some meaningful impact. And I can can start here. Um, so the, the our yeah, <laughs> I shall have to. But it's too hard. <laughs> um, the so our system is currently in use in in a hospital, um, and we're in the process of rolling it out into other hospitals as well. And um, generally, the feedback from the providers has been very positive. Um, so they're interested in the technology. They see the value, um, and they. Um, you know, I'm more frustrated about the challenges that exist in order to uh, fully deploy it um, due to us needing data out of the EMR. Um, it's typically, you know, a situation where, you know, we talk to the physicians, we talk to the administrators, we talk to the nurses. They all say, oh, that's great, let's do it. And then it takes three months in order to get data out of the EMR. Um, and, you know, it's something that they encounter many times um, throughout their, their day. Um, so that's that's really the biggest hurdle we face. So usually the issues are when you ask the provider to change their behavior somehow, then there is uh, like pushback. Have you actually asked the nurses to add some additional information so that you can use it in your system? <clears throat> yeah. In, um, it's true, yeah. Whenever people have to change, you know, there is resistance against it. Um, so we, we try to address it by not just showing up and saying, hey, here's our system, use it. Um, but in, in trying to incorporate their feedback into how they want to use it, how the interface should be designed. Um, you know, we do run um, into issues occasionally where the providers are older, they're not very technology savvy, they don't have a cell phone. Um, so, you know, part of our system, as Idris will uh, talk about tomorrow, um, <clears throat> is, uh, is mobile-based, so they, they use iOS devices. Um, and, you know, if you're, you know, a 60-year-old person that, you know, doesn't have a smartphone, doesn't want to use a smartphone, then that's a certain barrier. But, <clears throat> you know, I'm sure that problem will, you know, disappear over time simply because the technology is so pervasive. Um, <clears throat> and, um, yeah, I think... I should shut up and give other people opportunity to speak. So I think on the provider side, one, one important thing is the availability of resources. So uh, I think not every provider has uh, time and money to develop predictive algorithms or even sometimes purchase the IT tools which can make the predictions. But uh, an important aspect of predictive analytics is interpretability of the models. So if we have more open data out there, if the research is reproducible, we can actually uh, provide uh, the providers with some uh, package recommendations so that they can improve the quality of their uh, services. So it, it's a little bit indirect uh, benefit. So they don't have to sit in front of a computer, run a program, and then do blindly. Uh, probably they wouldn't even trust directly uh, the results of the uh, predictive algorithms. Uh, so they need to see why it's working, how it's functioning. Uh, just a follow-up. Uh, follow uh, this is a very good question. Uh, as researchers, we hope eventually the technologies we developed can be useful and can improve, really improve the healthcare uh, service. Uh, in reality, uh, there could be uh, uh, many barriers to uh, prevent uh, healthcare providers to adopt uh, our technology. Uh, my personal experience, uh, many years ago, I went to a hospital and uh, talked to the uh, the person who who is in who was in charge of the uh, IT in the entire hospital. So I talked about uh, 
mobile health systems, you know, the sensor-based systems, what they can offer. And uh, uh, the person said, you know, this is great, but we cannot use it. So why? Because, you know, uh, the healthcare is uh, somehow very sensitive, uh, uh, very uh, critical um, uh, domain uh, that allows very, very minimum error. So this um, person says, you know, if your system generates a wrong uh, recommendation, for example, you uh, attach the sensors to this patient to monitor uh, or predict when this person may have a heart attack, right? And your system detects, well, there's a very high chance, you know, in 15 minutes or so, this person will have a heart attack. Then you send an ambulance to this person's house, then he may get, you know, frustrated, right? So uh, a lot of things, and also another, um, uh, feeling I have uh, from my experience, interaction experience with, uh, with doctors is um, uh, still, uh, as researchers, uh, we probably, IT researchers, uh, for example, we need to uh, also educate uh, those healthcare professionals in terms of what techno today's technologies can offer. Uh, because in many cases, um, they may not be aware of you know, the, the current technology. Hi, Raymond Dewey from the National Library of Medicine. Um, this is for Joyce in the telemedicine um, research or topic. Uh, telemedicine in post-disaster situations is not new. Uh, there has been a lot of papers on it. Uh, and uh, from your presentation, I was, um, the information is a little vague. Uh, what do you mean by telemedicine packages? Uh, in post-disaster situations, uh, if you send in, uh, I mean, uh, the situation is there might not be a lot of healthcare professionals around the area that are trained to operate whatever package you send them. Uh, also, um, presupposing tele telemedicine intervention, you have to have a HIT framework or system that will operate with it. So, what particular detail was in you know your presentation? It was, it was just a little vague. Thanks. Um, well, obviously the telemedicine needs an infrastructure, it needs a communication devices. So that's what the push packages would do, would help bring in that communication device. And yes, the telemedicine, obviously the kits would need to be um, able to be utilized by folks who are not medical experts. So there is research to be done and, and ensure that those packages could be usable, easily usable by folks on the ground.